Welcome to our worship service for Sunday, February the 14th, 2021, Transfiguration Sunday. Just a couple of announcements. We will be celebrating Ash Wednesday Communion this coming Wednesday. And again, as last week, you are welcome to use whatever elements you have available at home to celebrate Communion. Also, if anyone is interested, at the Clark Summit Presbyterian Church on Ash Wednesday between 12 and 1 and 5 to 6, Pastor Bill Carter will be administrating ashes via automobile in the parking lot. So if you would like to participate in that, that's Wednesday between 12 and 1 and 5 and 6. And the only other announcement that I have this morning is that our annual meeting will be held on Sunday, March the 7th at 3 p.m. here in our sanctuary. Those of you who have reports that will be needed for the annual meeting should get them to Tim ASAP. Thank you. And now let us prepare to worship God as we listen to our organ prelude. worship God is our call to worship. Come, let us go to the holy mountain. And worship Christ with the disciples. We will see Christ transformed before us. We will see our lives transformed before Christ. Come, let us go to the holy mountain. And worship the Son of God. And let us pray together the prayer of invocation. Almighty God, God whose Son, Son was revealed in majesty, majesty before he suffered death upon the cross. Give us faith to perceive his glory, that being strengthened by his grace, we may be changed into his likeness, from glory to glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Thou reignest in glory, thou 
Thou dwellest in light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All praise we would render, all help us to seek is only the splendor of light hideth thee. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. God of transformation, you make new life where there was old, dazzling light where there were shadows, peace where there was violence, and friends where there were enemies. Forgive us, O God, when we stand in the way of your transforming love. Forgive us when we do not live as people who have been changed by your grace. Call us to the mountain once more, and send us out to be witnesses of your transforming grace. And let us pray our own personal silent confession. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy, who forgives all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And let us declare what we believe in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From thence he shall come and judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Gospel lesson today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly they looked around. They saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's interesting in the church today is the day we celebrate the transfiguration of Christ. In the world outside, however, this is better known as Valentine's Day. <laughs> well, Transfiguration Day is by far the more important of the two, but I certainly hope all the men in the church remembered it's Valentine's Day. You're in trouble if you didn't. 
it's so important that someone has prepared a list of ways how to tell you forgot Valentine's Day. Here are three of those ways. Number one, Hallmark calls, offering discounts on apology cards. <laughs> Two, the, the kids tell you that mom went to bed early and locked the door while you were taking out the trash. <laughs> and third, you wake up with a florist's ad stapled to your forehead. Oh dear. So I hope you husbands remember. Well, this morning we are going to a mountaintop with three of Jesus' disciples where they have an unforgettable experience. Speaking of mountaintop experiences, an unknown author tells us about a mountaintop experience that was unforgettable for one young man. A group of mountain climbers set out to conquer a high mountain. One of their number was a beginning climber making his first climb. The climb was a strenuous one, but at last they reached a small plateau at the top of the mountain. Once it was clear that the beginning climber was at the very top, he stood straight up and raised his arms and yelled victoriously, I did it! At this point, a strong gust of wind nearly blew him off the mountain. The more experienced climbers, of course, had a good laugh at this. And then they explained to him that when you get to the top of a mountain, you never stand straight up, but rather you drop to your knees to avoid being blown off the mountain top. Well, that's a good lesson when it comes to mountain top experiences. First, go to your knees. This morning, we are going to deal with history's most dramatic mountaintop experience, the one that literally drove three of Jesus' disciples to their knees. Chapters 8 and 9 of Mark's Gospel contain some of the most important events in the New Testament. Chapter 8 begins with the feeding of the 4,000, an extraordinary event and ends with Peter declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. It also concludes with Jesus predicting his own death. The, the disciples were both shocked and confused when Christ said that he must suffer and die. This wasn't what they thought would happen when they decided to drop everything to follow Jesus. So at the beginning of chapter 9, when Jesus called his inner circle, his closest friends, Peter and James and John, to go with him up the mountain, they were ready to go. Perhaps they thought in the rarefied air of the mountain, their minds were clear. There was no way the disciples could have prepared for what would take place on the top of that mountain. The Bible says on the mountain top, in the presence of his three disciples, Jesus was transfigured, a word from the original Greek, metamorpho, which is related, of course, to our word, metamorphosis, meaning to change form. Christ's face became bright as the sun, according to Matthew, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them, according to Mark. And as if this weren't enough, the disciples saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah, both of whom had been dead for hundreds of years. Moses, you will recall, gave the people of Israel the Ten Commandments and led them to the Promised Land. Elijah was the first prophet of Israel, and at his death, he was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. These two men represented the law and the prophets, the sources of authority in Jewish life. Well, Peter, who could always be counted on to say something whether appropriate or not, said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Mark speculates that Peter did not know what to say. They were so frightened. All three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
record Peter's words, which pretty well authenticates them that he said them. Have you ever been so afraid that all you could do was babble? People react in different ways to fear, don't they? Some become quite talkative, and others morosely silent. Fear brings out the best in some people, and others crack under the strain. Well, this was not the only time the disciples were fearful in Jesus' presence. There were many such occasions. Remember when he walked on the Sea of Galilee to join the disciples in their boat far out on the water? Matthew records that when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And then later, when Jesus appeared to them after his resurrection, Luke explains in his gospel that they were frightened and terrified again because they thought they were seeing a ghost. In this same chapter we're studying today, Mark chapter 9, Jesus tries to tell his disciples for a second time that he must be crucified. But after three days, he would rise. Mark tells us they did not understand what he was talking about, but they were afraid to ask him. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, how could anyone ever be afraid of Jesus? We have so sentimentalized this man from Nazareth that we can't even imagine grown men being afraid in his presence. But they were. And why not? If he is who we say he is, who could help being fearful in his presence? He was absolute purity, absolute love. Have you ever been in the presence of someone who was so perfect that they made you uncomfortable? Jesus sometimes had that kind of effect on people. Maybe he's had that kind of effect on us at times. But the verses that follow Peter's mindless babbling are very insightful. Mark tells us, then a cloud appeared and covered them. The Jewish people, of course, associated God with a cloud, remembering how God led the ancient Israelites in a cloud through the desert. On the Mount of Transfiguration, the voice of God thundered from the cloud, This is my Son, whom I love. Listen to him. At this, according to Matthew, the three disciples fell on their faces and were filled with awe, driven to their knees on a mountain. If there was any question that there was something different about Jesus, it's dispelled here. Son of man, son of God, savior of the world, Emmanuel, king of kings, lord of lords. All three writers record that God spoke and identified Jesus as his son and commanded the disciples to listen to him. Suddenly, Mark says, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. It was a striking experience that the disciples would remember all of their lives. Years later, Peter wrote in his second epistle, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him on the mountain from the majestic glory. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. Can you imagine the impact that this experience had on Peter and James and John? They were kneeling in the presence of God. John Tal Murphy, in his book, Made to be Master, tells about the impact that walking on the moon had on two of America's astronauts. For one of them, he says, 
Moonwalking had been his greatest goal in life, and he labored tirelessly toward achieving that goal. But once it was attained, he explained, there was no higher goal, and he became disillusioned. He lost his ambition, he lost his drive, and finally he suffered an emotional breakdown. For another astronaut, however, the moon visit meant something totally different. In his autobiography, To Rule the Night, James Irwin wrote, as we flew into space, we had a new sense of ourselves, of the earth, and of the nearness of God. We were outside ordinary reality. I sensed the beginning of something deep change taking place inside of me. And he continued, the ultimate effect has been to deepen and strengthen all the religious insight I ever had. On the moon, the total picture of the power of God and his son, Jesus Christ, became abundantly clear to me. Who could not be affected by walking on the surface of the moon? And who could not be affected by being in the presence of Christ as his divinity was being made manifest? The time came for Jesus and his three disciples to come down off the mountain. As Peter, James, and John descended the mountain, they pondered the significance of what they had just experienced. My guess is that they walked back down in silence. They were too filled with awe to speak. Well, the disciples would make their way back into the valley, but a part of them would forever be on that mountain. Their fear had been transformed to faith. The focus of that faith was Christ and Christ alone. As they came down off the mountain, Jesus instructed them not to tell anyone of their experience. Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. The time would come when they would tell everyone, but the time wasn't right yet. Jesus and his disciples still had work to do, and that's why they couldn't stay on the mountain. Dwight L. Moody was an American evangelist in the 1800s, and he wrote about meeting a man at one of his meetings who testified that he had lived on the Mount of Transfiguration for five years. I suppose by that he meant that he had lived in the presence of Jesus for that long. So Moody asked him, how many souls have you led to the healing light of Christ? The man said, I don't know. Have you saved anyone from the pit of despair or the sting of death? Moody asked him. Can't say that I have, the man replied. Well, that's not the kind of mountain experience that makes any difference, Moody said. When we get so high, when we get so high that we can't reach down to other people, there's something wrong. Jesus told the three disciples who were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration that they were to keep silence about what they had seen until after he was resurrected from the grave. Then they were to tell everyone. And that is where we are today. In our time together this morning, we've been with Jesus and the three disciples on the mountaintop. In our minds and hearts, hopefully, we've been driven to our knees. When we return to our everyday lives tomorrow, it's our turn to witness with our lives as well as with our speech that we have been in the presence of the transfigured Christ, the Son of Man, Son of God, Savior of the world, Emmanuel, God with us, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Amen. Joys and concerns this week. We have two joys. We wish happy birthday to Mary Lubachan and Lisa Rischinger this coming Saturday. And would you add to your prayer concerns the name of Lauren Ursel? And so let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. 
Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity of gathering, even though we are apart, gathering together around your word. And hopefully, Lord, one of these days we will indeed gather together in person. But Lord, thank you for the opportunity of worshiping with our family and with our friends today. And Father, we pray that you would be with each one of us, you know, our own particular situations, of where we are, what we are dealing with. And Father, we just ask that you would help us to see your love and your care and your will for us in what is happening around us. Lord, we don't understand it completely, and perhaps that's just as well, that that means that we have to put our faith and our trust in you, that you are in control, and that you are know what, you'll know what is going to happen. Father, as we have done for many weeks, we pray for those uh, of our friends and our family who are in special need. Dolores, Shannon, Austin, Lori, Gary, Alberta, Sue, Joyce, Gretchen and Les, Wade, Bob and Carol, Andrea, Neil, Dory, Allie, Carol, Yolanda, Andrea, Mary Beth, Craig, Lauren, and loved ones who are unable to be with us because they are isolated either at home or in nursing homes. Lord, we pray for them in a special way. Pray for those who are taking care of them, whether it's family members or professionals, that you would show them the care that that's needed. Father, we pray for our nation at this difficult time. Lord, pray for our president and his cabinet and decisions that are being made, even right now in this day, that will affect us. And we pray for our state government as well and our local officials who are doing their best for us as citizens of this wonderful land. Lord, we have come, as we mentioned, with many concerns in our hearts. And so we take these moments of silent prayer to bring these to you with deep meaning. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And again, we thank you for your gifts and offerings that have been mailed to the church and dropped off in the mailbox at the front of the church. We appreciate your continued concern for the ministry of this congregation. And so we thank you once again.
opportunity and privilege of returning a portion of the blessings you have given us this past week. We pray that we'll be blessed in our giving, and we praise you for the generosity that you have shown to us that we are able to pass on to others. Lord, continue your work in this church and this community. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And our closing hymn is Arise, Your Light is Come. Arise, your light is come, the Spirit's call obey. Show forth the glory of your God, which shines on you today. Arise, your light is come, flee wide the prison door. Tidings to the poor. Arise, your light is come, all you in sorrow born. Grind up the broken hearted ones and comfort those who mourn. Arise, your light is come, the mountains burst in song. Rise up like eagles on the wing, God's power will make us strong. Now receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>